thanks everyone for joining us. Good morning, good uh, almost afternoon to some, I suppose. Uh, thank you for joining us for Top of Wallet, Top of Mind, How Larky Can Drive Increased Payment Card Usage. We are really excited to be here. Uh, I'm Scott Brown, VP of Growth with Larky. For those of you that don't know, Larky is a QSO that helps community financial institutions better engage with their audience. Uh, we do so by tapping into the power of the digital banking channel to give the credit union the means to send targeted, meaningful push notifications directly to the account holders. So uh, think about any objective that you're trying to drive and the, the way that you communicate it out to your audience. We simply give you a complement to your existing communication strategy, uh, giving you a very direct and relevant way to do so. Again, tapping into the power of digital banking uh, through through push notifications. So we'll, we'll touch a little bit about what we do on the topic today, but but really that that's the, the core of what we're here for is to talk to our good friend and FinTech legend, Doug Layton. Doug, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Doug is the former head of Visa's community account segment, where he led a team responsible for the sales and relationship management of around 7,500 US-based community banks and credit unions. Since leaving Visa, Doug has focused on a variety of interests, including advising fintechs that are committed to community financial institution success, curating events, bringing fintechs and FIs together, supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in financial services and, and the community at large, and providing thought leadership on managers and their direct impact on employee well-being and psychological safety. Uh, in addition to all that, Doug is an all-around great guy, again, a legend in our industry. And, and thank you so much for being here, Doug, to share your, your wisdom and insight. Well, Scott, you are, you're too kind. I think uh, I, I can only say I would be a legend in the fintech industry is if you count Visa as a fintech. And I think Visa would like to think it is the original fintech. And so there you go. all those years with Visa might add up to a little bit of a tenured status. A absolutely. So but Doug brings a wealth of knowledge. So you know, we decided for today's webinar, we would ditch the PowerPoint and just keep this really light, keep it conversational. So as Brett mentioned, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, we'll go through this. I've got some questions to kind of pick Doug's brain on best practices, on some of the things he's seen throughout his tenure, and to give us a little bit of a, a state of the union about the card industry as to where it is today and where we're headed towards in the future. So, um, but with all that said, I, I've got some questions prepared. We'll have a great conversation with Doug. Please go ahead and add to the conversation by using the Q&A and we'll get kicked off. So as questions come up, just uh, just let us know and we'll look forward to getting through those and having a conversation with the, the audience at the end. Um, but let, let's kick things off with this, Doug. Given your extensive experience in the industry, you've truly seen cards go from a nice to have to one of the key drivers of the banking relationship. And let's not forget a key revenue source. Can you talk to us about some of the major shifts you've seen throughout your career, specifically as it's related to the card space for community FIs? Yeah, it's been quite a ride. Uh, I started in Visa in 1998. And you know, at that time, Visa was an association. Uh, it was an association of member banks and credit unions. It actually operated like a nonprofit. It wasn't a nonprofit in the sense of, you know, a charitable organization or a philanthropic organization that didn't pay taxes, but in fact, it ma it managed to zero profitability, which was a pretty interesting environment to really start to work uh, my career. I had worked at Wells Fargo for a number of years prior to joining Visa, in fact, starting there when I was in college as a teller. Visa at the time I was there was an incredibly well-known brand, but a also a very misunderstood organization. When I told my friends I was starting to work at Visa, they assumed that I was joining a company that had 200, 300,000 employees, uh, when in reality, there was maybe 3,500 employees. And that's because the banks and the credit unions are the ones that did all the work. Visa switched the transactions and built the brand. That's what Visa was responsible for. Uh, and in fact, for the most part, while the brand itself was very powerful, the the whole credit and debit environment, particularly debit, was pretty sleepy in the sense that, yeah, it was there. It was in a, you know, we we provided it as an accommodation for our customers or members. Uh, we debit was still not universally even deployed. There were still a lot of banks and credit unions that didn't have debit cards at that point. Uh, and then over time, you saw that as payments became more ubiquitous, as consumers 
had more opportunities to spend with their cards. We opened up new areas of acceptance that the payments industry, the payments effort within banks and credit unions started to really grow. And it started to be an important element of revenue diversification because it brought non-interest income into the bank or credit union. Uh, and now when you look at today, like your payment cards or your credential, as we would call them when they're put into a mobile device um, or stored in a website, I mean, that is the primary way that you're interacting with your customers and members. That's how your brand is getting in front of them every single day. And when you think again about the ubiquity, I'm sure there are many of us here uh, on this uh, call that are old enough to remember checks and ordering checks and getting special, you know, getting a University of Georgia checks, that sort of thing. I mean, who writes checks anymore? If you're at a supermarket or a drugstore and somebody writes a check in front of you, you're pretty frustrated. That's now, you know, just in the space of really, you know, 20 years, that industry has completely turned from cash and credit to make payments to now almost exclusively on payment cards. And that's why it's so important to have a thoughtful payments strategy. Yeah, that, that's great, Doug. It's really wild to think about Visa having 3,500 employees and even more wild to think about them as a functioning nonprofit. That that kind of blew my mind a little bit. But um, you're right. Yeah. I mean, card programs are ubiquitous. They are I hate to say it, but almost commoditized at this point. So it is it is a key revenue source for, for financial institutions, but it mm -hmm. is really, really hard to differentiate. So maybe talk to us a little bit about the importance of a community FI having a market competitive debit and credit card program and, and really how they can accomplish that. Yeah. But Scott, you know, your phrasing on that is really important because you didn't say you have to have a market leading program. Uh, one of the pushbacks that I've gotten throughout my career, both at Visa and Post around credit specifically, is a frustration by smaller financial institutions saying they can't compete. They can't compete against the bigger players that have co-brand programs, that do national television advertising, and that offer some pretty rich rewards programs. Um, the fact of the matter is you don't need to provide those things. You, you don't need to be competing against the very best rewards programs in terms of you know airline club access or all these other things. Your customers and members, they do business with you for a reason. They want to work with a community-based financial institution. And as such, they're really just looking for a market competitive product. Sure, from a credit card standpoint, it has to have rewards. From your debit card standpoint, you have to enable Google Pay and Apple Pay and Samsung Pay and other ways in which you can use the product. You have to have contactless. Uh, but if you have a product that leverages your uh, specific skills, your specific differentiation, whether that's on customer service or something else, a, a university affiliation, as an example, you can win those customers and you can drive a lot of payment volume on your cards. Um, you know, this is how you interact now with your customers and your members, you know, it is through the payment program. It's where you drive a lot of data that can be utilized to sell other products and services. It's where you get a lot of data that helps you better understand who your customers and members are. Uh, and so you want to have that program that is appealing, but of course still profitable. And there is, you know, there are lots and lots of successful programs out there, aren't out there banking against the you know, really exclusive big bank cards or co-brand cards from the standpoint of the rewards value, but are providing a value that is specific to the needs of your customers and your members. Uh, and within that, you can have a winning program. Yeah, that, that's awesome, Doug. So it sounds like really understanding the community aspect. I, I mean, it is, it, it's a tough hill to climb, right? I mean, you yeah. are you're competing against some really big names with some very robust programs, but I, I I think there is still there are I know that there are still ways that community financial institutions can win that wallet share battle with these Ooh. larger names. What are um, let's see? I, I think I want to ask you this: What are some uh, what are some of the ways that community FIs can compete against these large banks and co-branded cards? 
and um, selfishly, how can Larky help? I mean, you you kind of you know the the value that we bring to the market. I'm curious to hear your perspective on that. Well, like I said, you just have for when it comes to your uh, particularly on a credit product, uh, you know, you just need to be in the ballpark. You don't need to have the product that is you know super expensive both for you to administer and for your customers or members, you know, in the form of a annual fee uh, to pay for. Uh, and here's the way I think, you know, your customers and your members way better than the big banks and the co-brand cards, which are issued by big banks, you know them way better than they do. And so, you know, the services and products, the rates and rewards offered by your financial institution, that reflects your customers and your members' needs. Um, I think you look at your card programs in the same way. Like, what is it that makes you unique? Why do people come to your bank or credit union in the first place? And why do they stay? Uh, take that lens and then apply that to the same types of, of value that you put out on your on your credit card or your debit card. Um, and this is where Larky can really help, right? Larky helps by enabling you to highlight your brand promise. Uh, you know, what makes you unique? What are the values that your financial institution provides to your cardholders? And then you can take advantage of that channel to remind them about the safety and security of using a, a payment card, um, or maybe like highlighting a new acceptor. Uh, while we think of payment cards being rather ubiquitous, you know, there still are avenues in which payment cards are uh, growing in acceptance. This is primarily within bill pay segments, uh, but you think of like a local biller, I, they're the uh, garbage company in our neighborhood still doesn't take payment cards. Where that's one of the few things, one of the few areas we write a check each month. Once that eventually, once they eventually turn on that capability, that be Larky communicating that proactively to me. It's like, hey, do you know you can use your X branded card at the local, uh, at, you know, to pay your garbage bill, and you know that is a benefit that that card is. Being that that is a benefit that the financial institution now is like offering me by the fact that they issue that card, and you want to promote those sorts of things. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. the the um, The thing that we hear from our clients and and those that are um, engaged with us before their clients really is that they have a hard time a hard time getting their their audience's attention. Like, mm -hmm. let's just be honest, we are. I mean, here we are, and we're on this webinar. We're in our own little boxes in our own environments. People are are really disconnected today, and so when we want to drive a particular objective, in this case, card volume and, and card usage, you need a channel. You need to you need a channel that people resonate with, that people pay attention mm -hmm. to. And so, some of the things we at Larky have done to help our clients is tap into the digital channel to get those messages of value, that brand promise that debit cards bring to the, the member or the customer out in front of the, the audience. So um, for example, we know that it is, it's critical to get cards activated, right? We open a checking yeah. account, tie a debit card to it. We need that card activated. So the customer member begins swiping and using it right away and beginning their relationship with that particular uh, FI. What we have done is we have created card activation campaigns where we are using this powerful channel of digital being our mobile devices to get that message out, to ensure that the audience that we want to talk to, those folks that have cards that need to be activated are listening to the message. And, mm -hmm. and it's not, um, it's not like this rocket science thing that we tapped into. It's, it's very sort of basic at its nature. And I'll just be transparent. We are, we're on this webinar. I, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be talking to you and sharing all of your insight with the audience and sharing some of the value that Larky provides. And I'm really focused on our conversation, but as disciplined and as focused as I try to be, my phone is on a stand to the left of my screen. <laughs> and as it lights up, I break concentration and I look at it. 
So yeah. in giving the FI the power to tap into that sort of mentality and giving them the ability to light up their customer or members' phones with this relevant messaging about the safety and security of the debit card program mm -hmm. or the reason why the card should be activated, it has become really, really powerful in giving the FI that tool to communicate this, this sort of value. Um, yeah. I'd like to touch on one other thing we've done. And so we also have the power to tap into geolocation-based messaging. So think about, I love this example, and we've um, we've helped numerous clients do this, and it's been wildly successful. But think about, your, put yourself in, in the community financial institution's shoes where you are competing with these large um, these large credit cards and these large banks and trying to bring your card top of wallet. And you want to just kind of whisper in the, the customer or member's ear when they're at the retail, hey, use us. There's value in this. This is your community. These are the reasons why this is the best card for you to use. So we've we've given the, the FIs the tools to do that using using the digital channel and using geolocation. So when a when a card holder pulls up to say a gas pump and we've geofenced that gas station, we can then send a targeted message to the mobile device, which I just shared. We look at when they light up. It's it's part of our mentality today, and reminding them of the value of using that card. So it, it has been a really really good tool to generate additional usage, and I, I just find it fascinating because like you touched on, it is so ultra competitive and it is so hard to get that message out that having this really, really calculated and personal communication channel has been incredibly fruitful. Um, yeah. yeah. I also want to comment on your the the debit activation piece. There, debit cards and debit utilization is very likely your number one payment product. Uh, you know, certainly is across the the networks. If you look at the data from Visa and MasterCard, debit transactions far outweigh credit transactions. Credit may have more volume because they're larger transaction amounts, but the number of debit trend, the number of transactions tends to favor debit. And that's also where you get a really good sense of what your customer and what your member is doing, you know, where they're spending and that sort of thing. Uh, but Activating a debit card is a time-bound exercise when you have a new customer or member walk into a branch or apply online. You really only have about 45 days. Uh, and this is an interesting area where you can also partner with your network, with Visa or MasterCard, to help with activation strategies in conjunction with Larky as a tool to communicate directly to your uh, customers and members that in those first 45 days are critical to be pushing out messages and to be engaged with your new customer member to talk about the value that that debit card brings, both from a safety and security standpoint, uh, as well as customer service standpoint, um, as well as all the different areas in which it is accepted the value that it brings. Uh, candidly, if you have an inactive debit card, somebody who's inactive after 90 days, uh, it's probably not an effective, you're, you're probably wasting your money uh, reaching out to that customer. So using tools like Larky in those first 45 days to get them engaged to, you know, uh, showcase, like Scott said, you know, if they're at a gas station, they could use their card and maybe get a reward for doing so. That's critical to building a uh, an active debit card user. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. That first, uh, first like 30 to 45 days is so critical. One of the things that we've helped FIs do is set up a, a campaign, which is adding some automated engagement out to the audience to drive that type of that desired behavior, in this case, card activation. So we're not only adding a very direct channel of communication that is incredibly effective, but we're also adding automation. So the, the, um, we all wear a million hats and we're all being pulled in a million different directions. So what better way to get this across than through an automated fashion where mm -hmm. we're not manually sending notifications. We're not manually making LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter posts mm -hmm. at, or, or sending postcards. We have this automated notification process using the digital banking platform as that channel to get push notifications out. And it's been really, right. really useful. Um, it's it's a campaign and because of the effectiveness of you you can't push that window out a little bit. So yeah. whereas it might not make sense to send a letter or a postcard to somebody 90 days out, uh, there still may be opportunities with Larky because it's much more cost-effective. 
Yeah, it's also a really good way for the FI, if this is on brand for them, to have some fun messaging. I, I love the notifications yeah. that we see that go out that say, hey, uh, am I buried in the bottom of your junk drawer? And just like real cheeky, lighthearted messaging that is in this day and age, it's the way we communicate. We use emojis. We use this lighthearted form of communication. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it, it is, it's fun, but it's also incredibly effective. I, I want to take that's a, also how you that's also how you drive your brand. You know, that's you your brand promise, you know, how you bring the brand to your customers and members in that lighthearted way also creates that connection between them and yourself. It, it, absolutely. And it, it is more important now than ever, especially as as community FIs look at diversifying the age of the overall account base, that sort of modern way of communication is is beyond critical at this point. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to take a, um, not a negative spin, but a realistic take at, at this and talk about some of the challenges that that community FIs face. Mm -hmm. um, there are certainly all sorts of reasons for financial institutions to have a really, really strong payments program. Um, but if we're being realistic, there are headwinds, there are, there's uncertainty out there. What, yeah. given your experience and your, your look forward at, in the industry, what are some uh, what are some things that FI should prepare for or look out for? Yeah. So recall at the beginning of the conversation, I said that payments was kind of a sleepy little part of the business. And uh, I'd say for the most part, there was not a whole lot of interest in the payments industry from the standpoint of regulatory intervention, you know, government oversight. Uh, only the very largest merchants, Walmart primarily, were paying attention to the cost related to payments. Um, now that has all changed. As payments have grown in importance, when they've grown in stature, you know, so has competition, and so has the threat of regulation. And in the fact, and in the case of debit cards, very real and substantial regulation, uh, coupled with the improvements in technology, you know, as technology has advanced, as computing powers advanced, as new technologies such as blockchain have come along, that further enables more competitors and it further kind of pushes the, um, the willingness and the desire for governments to step in and seek to regulate what is an incredibly important industry uh, to your balance sheets, to your bottom line, uh, as well as the U.S., you know, as well as just kind of the U.S. GDP, uh, you know, if, if Visa and MasterCard were to go down, you know, you could have some pretty significant uh, impacts on, on consumer spending and in the economy writ large. Uh, there is, you know, one threat that I think you are probably all somewhat familiar with, but I'll take a little bit of a detour to talk about it. And this is specifically related to uh, proposed legislation. Uh, Senator Dick Durbin who spearheaded the Durban Amendment, which caused uh, a significant amount of disruption in the debit uh, card marketplace, uh, ultimately driving down uh, inter uh, interchange rates for debit, both for the largest financial institutions that are regulated and the smaller ones that are technically not regulated, but were still impacted, uh, as well as the added complexity of having multiple networks on every single one of your cards. Uh, Senator Durbin is now looking at credit. And he has proposed uh, what's called the Credit Card Competition Act, or abbreviated CCCA, uh, which would look at consumer credit. Now, you may have seen that the CCCA, which is uh, would require multiple networks on every credit card. So think of your credit card today that has a Visa logo a, or a MasterCard logo, um, or to a lesser extent, Discover and American Express. That would, you'd have to have two different credit card networks on that. So when you went to make a purchase, just in the same way you do with debit today, where debit, you the, the merchant can choose one of two networks. Senator Durbin wants to give the merchant the opportunity to choose one of two credit networks. Now, not only would this be extraordinarily disruptive to just the way that the, the system is plumbed today, it's just not built to accommodate that you know, there are still POS machines out there that look at a five and route it to MasterCard automatically at the beginning. Um, and there's another element of this, which is the CCA only targets banks 
over well, and one credit union, <laughs> over a hundred billion in assets. Uh, and I think that has caused some uh, some feeling that, oh, well, this isn't a bad thing for us as a community-based financial institution. Uh, but the reality is it's a bad thing. And we as an industry need to be advocating for government to stay out of this industry, to not regulate this, because while there appears to be these carve-outs um, in the same way that Durban in for the debit had a carve out for financial institutions under 10 billion we all know that it was extremely impactful and it caused uh disruption it caused reduced revenue and it was um uh, and it was unnecessary governmental intervention so i encourage everybody here on this call to reach out to their network um, partner yeah, visa or mastercard uh, put your hand up and say yeah i will advocate on behalf of um, stopping this legislation, working with you. The best voice in Washington um, is community-based financial institutions, each of you. And uh, I just want to encourage you to feel that, to, to know that while this may seem like it won't impact you, ultimately it will. It will impact you. It'll disrupt the entire industry. Um, it will almost certainly have a you know problematic effect on interchange. And so I encourage you to get involved and to you know, step out and say, this is an industry that is functioning extremely well, doesn't need to be regulated. Um, outside of regulation, you know, we get to the competition part. It is super vital for you to continually be innovative and you know, to continue to be working to uh, leverage technologies like Larky to engage with your cardholders. Um, I'll tell you this much, whether it's merchants, technology companies, other financial institutions, they'll be leveraging new capabilities like open banking and real-time payments. This is more aligned with debit than what I was just talking about from a credit standpoint, but they're going to be taking advantage of these new technologies that are coming along, these new capabilities that are being created, and they're going to be targeting your debit card holders. You want to be ahead of that in the standpoint of saying you want your card holders to constantly be saying when a merchant with a new tech company comes in and says, hey, Give us your banking credentials and we'll make this, you know, we'll give you this little reward and we'll give you this little thing over here. You want your cardholders to say, nope, I want to pay with my bank debit card. I want to pay with my credit union credit card because of the, you know, what makes you unique, what what you provide to them. Um creating active preference for your products so that a a merchant or a tech company comes up with what they think is the newest idea that your customers or members just say, nope, I'm super happy with how this works and I want to continue with it. Uh, there's a, I had a quote from a, 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 a CEO at a credit union say that they're going to enable every way for their members to pay. So they're going to turn on things like real-time payments. They're going to create capabilities around open banking. They're going to give their members any way to pay, but they're going to do everything they can to encourage their members to pay with their debit and credit cards because those are the highest revenue sources for the financial institution. That's where they get the best and richest data. And that ultimately is where they want to see the, you know, the, the preponderance of their spend. So create these that say may say we're going to open up to different technologies we don't want to disadvantage our customers or members but at the same time we're going to create the reasons why they use their debit and credit card to pay every single day yeah i mean the, the, obviously that's critical because we, we we as an industry want to make it easy for folks to work with community fis and so we want to make sure that that customers and members have all the tools at their disposal to make their lives easier mm -hmm. but uh if we're being honest with ourselves we also want to protect this very critical income stream and and it is mm -hmm. such an ever-changing and fast-paced um sector of our industry that we really need to be mindful of these things so Thank you for for bringing our attention to that. It, it's very very interesting. Um, I promise we will get to fun stuff very shortly, but I, I do want to talk about one more concerning part of of card usage, and that is that's fraud. That is um, yeah. that has been a big focus of how do we mitigate fraud while also continuing to increase card usage. And so I'm curious to hear your take, Doug, on 
I guess the need for critical information relative to card fraud, anything that you have in terms of risk mitigation um, and so on. So I, I will, I'll end it there and, and ask you to kind of share yeah. some insight. So Scott, I think there's two things that are important to consider here. Um, and before we get to that, I just want to, I want to recognize that I know that fraud and fraud losses are a key concern at your financial institution. Um, over the years, I've talked to hundreds of uh, leaders at banks and credit unions across the country, and I could say without fail that in the top three of the things that are they worry about, the things that they want to make sure that they are actively managing, risk and fraud is a is evergreen in the top three, uh, and certainly payment card fraud is part and parcel to that conversation. Uh, so there's a couple of things. One is and is leveraging cardholder alerts. Um, and you know, cardholder alerts, when they first came out, you know, say, gosh, maybe 10 years ago, be that via text message, be that via um a email or a push notification, um, you know, they weren't widely, they weren't widely disseminated. Um I was always advocating, and subsequently, the larger finance, the larger networks have mandated them. But I was advocating that the real the value in alerts is the fact that it deputizes your customer or your member in the fight against fraud. Consumers are smart, and they recognize that while they have zero liability, and we'll talk about that here in a moment, they have zero liability for fraudulent transactions. So they may not be out of pocket when fraud happens on their account, and they may not know whether the financial institution or the merchant ultimately bears that fraud. Um, they're smart enough to know that when fraud happens, that is going to drive up their prices, whether the merchant charging more to compensate for the fraud losses, whether the financial institution raising its fees to compensate for losses. So consumers want to participate in this. And I'm sure many of us here on this call have stories where you were sitting around in the evening and to Scott's point, your phone dinged and you looked at it and it was an alert that said that your card was used to purchase gas in a state on the other side of the country or you know some, you know, some type of transaction that was apparent to you that you did not do it. And what's the first thing you do? You reach out to your financial institution. Now you may not have stopped that one fraud that one fraudulent transaction, but I'll bet you, you end up stopping a string of fraudulent transactions after that. And that's where I think getting consumers, getting customers and members involved in this fight in the standpoint of using proactive technologies to reach out um, when a transaction happens is super, super important. Secondarily, uh, but of equal importance is reminding your customers and members that the payment cards that you provide them are the safest way to pay, that you have zero liability if there is fraud on your card, um, which exceeds government regulations. Government says it's $50. Uh, the networks have all said and financial institutions have gladly gone along to say, no, we will cover 100%. You'll have zero liability. And that's been, that's been the case really for 25 years now, close to. Um, Larky is a wonderful tool to communicate that, to constantly remind people that their debit and credit cards are the safest way for them to pay. Um, and this is super critical when it comes to online purchases as well. Uh, and we'll dig into that here in a, in a moment. Um, it's also the safest way for you to communicate if there are some type of fraud ring going around, if there are some scams, if you're seeing your customers attempted to, um, you know, people to give up their banking credentials in a fraudulent manner, uh, the very safest way to communicate that is using Larky's technology, which pushes through the mobile banking app, right? It's not a text message. It's not an email. Those can be spoofed quite easily. Online banking, push notifications, those are safe and secure. And so it's a fraud is, you know, it's it's a it's a ever-present concern. 
but there are ways in which using Larky and using other technologies that you can not only get the word out in a safe and secure manner, use it from a marketing standpoint to remind customers about the safety and security of your payment products, uh, but also deputize your customers and members in the fight against fraud by reaching out to them in real time. Yeah, I, I love that. I love deputizing the the account holders, giving them ownership, giving them the ability to better protect themselves and in turn protect the FI. Um, mm -hmm. It's so fascinating that when, when we built Larky, this was this external facing, really driven at marketing, at driving the sales of products and services for, for FIs. And that is still a major focus of ours and how we help banks and credit unions drive revenue from getting new products out there, whether it's deposit products or mm -hmm. loans, et cetera. Um, probably the number two use case, and it's a it's a really close number two now, is risk mitigation. And it's yeah. using this powerful channel to get critical messages out in near real time that, hey, something's going on. Don't respond to this text message. Reminder, never hand over your login credentials via email. And it has proved so mm -hmm. powerful in stopping these, these um fraud events in their tracks yeah. that having that that critical channel of communication has proven to be um invaluable for for these financial institutions and so i think what i was hearing from you doug is proactive communication is is it's twofold right it's all about stopping or mitigating fraud we'll never stop it but it's about mitigating and lessening fraud and then it's also about using that as an opportunity to strengthen the brand and to share with the account mm -hmm. holder, with the card holder. This is why we're here for you. This is how we have your right. back. This is how we are in this journey together. So it's a really interesting use case. It's a really interesting value proposition that, mm -hmm. um, again, quite frankly, we we had never really thought about in the early stages of, of doing what we do, but it has proven to be a critical, um, mm -hmm. critical value that we provide to community FIs. Right. And it's a great way to stop this these types of events. Um, yeah, Doug. Before we we get to your kind of hit list, and I'm so excited to hear kind of your takeaways, the things that we want to leave the financial mm -hmm. institutions with. Um, we'll get to Q and A. Well, I, I guess we'll go into that right now. What I am I am curious to hear your sort of um, wrap up on some of the top things community FIs should do or, or maybe what they shouldn't do what are some what are some uh gotchas that we have when it comes to the overall payments program strategy yeah yeah let me break this down into credit cards debit cards and then sort of overall payment strategy so we'll start with credit cards um the first thing for the uh fis on today's call is i encourage you uh, if you have a credit card program, and, and I would imagine that some may not, you may have opted to um, uh, sell that program or to have a third-party provider um, uh, offer that to you in uh, the form of an agent banking program. Um, but if you have a program, I encourage you to think of your program as a spending program, not a lending program. Develop the program that encourages people to spend on the card, whether that's via rewards or other value added services. Um, you don't have to lead with APR. You know, your APR is almost certainly going to be more competitive than larger financial institutions APRs. That's great. Uh, but it shouldn't be the main focal point of your marketing. It should not be what the program is designed around, which is just to get people to maybe do a balance transfer and, and park it there for six months. Uh, you want that to become a regular part of, you know, their spending and in such they will drive balances that way. In addition to any sort of balance transfer that you may be able to attract. So I guess the key thing for credit cards is spending program, um, not a lending program. Uh, as we noted earlier in the conversation, you want to have a market competitive rewards program. Doesn't have to be the very best but it should be in the ballpark and it should reflect the uniqueness of your financial institution that, you know, the, the very reasons why your customers and members do their banking, you know, go to you for financial services, what it is, how can you take that and, and um, bring that same value to the uh, credit card product? Um, I think it's important to have a, a comprehensive product suite of of different credit products that start from a secured product, the credit builder type of product, 
all the way up through a premium product. You know, those are typically broken down into four uh, groups. You've got a secure card, uh, some type of credit builder product. You have a non-rewards card, which is unsecured. So the first step into unsecured. Then you have a, a standard rewards card, and then you have a premium rewards card. Um, many financial institutions that I've worked with over the years rolled out new premium cards or rolled out new secure cards and had extraordinary success uh, just within their own members because they were uh, their own customers and members because they were um, they were providing products that met the needs of their existing customers and members. Uh, so those are the key things, I think, on credit. To recap, it's a spending program, not a lending program. Have market competitive rewards and have a full product suite from credit builder to premium. On the debit card side, uh, this one I really just have one takeaway on on debit, and that is uh, dispel the notion that your debit card is less safe online than your credit cards are. You know, Today, there are still pundits out there. You still could turn on CNBC, uh, Bloomberg News, and hear somebody jump on there saying, you shouldn't use a debit card online because if it's compromised, then you're stealing, the, the, the criminal is stealing your money as opposed to a credit card where they're stealing the financial institution's money. You have zero liability on this, right? The Your members and your customers have zero liability. They're not stealing that, that customer or member's money. The um, There's two things when it comes to debit. One is it can be an inconvenience if your debit card is compromised because it does tap into your ready funds. This is where you need to communicate using Larkey to say that we're going to resolve this ASAP. Like if there is fraud on your debit card, Unfortunate as that may be, we're there. We have your back. We are going to put that money back into your account immediately. We'll, we'll still resolve what's going on here, but we're going to put the money back in your account so that your mortgage payment, your rent payment, your car payment doesn't bounce. You know, those are key elements, I think, to assuage people's fears about using their debit cards online. It used to be that Online purchases were primarily things that you would, you know, get like at a Best Buy or other you know, electronic things that were more suited towards credit cards. Now, the way that we shop, and this has certainly been in, uh, uh, accelerated by the pandemic, everything we buy can be bought online, whether it's making uh, buying our groceries at the local supermarket and then going to pick them up. And having somebody just bring them out to your vehicle or even having them shipped over, that's an online purchase. Those are purchases that have traditionally been debit card purchases. And if people are leery about using their card in that way, that's a transaction that you're losing. So make sure that you are actively communicating how you have your customers and members back in the, in the unlikely event that fraud happens and that you are talking about zero liability and the safety and security of your uh, debit card products. Because as more and more transactions move online, that's where all the growth is happening in payment cards is e-commerce online transactions. If your debit cards are being left behind, then you're being left behind in that growth. Uh, the last thing when you think about sort of across both types of products, uh, you absolutely want to get your cards to top of wallet. And when we say top of wallet, we don't just they're not just talking about the physical wallet, but having your cards in Google Pay, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, um, being in the default position at e-commerce merchants uh, like Amazon and recurring billers like Netflix. Uh, you want to be actively communicating to your customers and members the types of rewards and benefits they get. Um, do some research into uh, you know looking at uh, trends on consumers spending and to see if there may not be having, if you can identify if your uh, customer member's card is not being used at um, a merchant's uh, uh, e-commerce site. I think you have to enable tap to pay. I mean, the, again, accelerated by the pandemic, but it's, I think, well over 60% of all merchant locations today have tap to pay. It's fast. It's easy. It is it is just as secure as inserting a card. It uses the exact same technology. Um, 
you have to, whether it's through the mobile device or whether it's an actual card product with tap to pay, I think that is important. Um, and lastly, when a new card is issued the branch, and this is getting to Scott, you know, our conversation a little bit earlier about activation, when you have a new card issued the branch, take that time right then to work with that new customer member, put the card, instant issue the card, put it into, have that person put it into their Google Pay, have them put it up to the default position, you know, maybe say like, hey, do you have a Netflix account? Do you know that, you know, we can, you can pay your bills on Netflix with this card. And at that very moment, when you've got the, that person right there, take that time to showcase how valuable that payment product is to, uh, to them. And in turn, you'll benefit from having that up in a default position or enabling additional technologies for them to use the card. Awesome, Doug. Those those are some really powerful takeaways for our audience. Thank you, thank you for sharing. It is um, it, it's a it's a constant battle, but it's one that can be won. I, I wholeheartedly oh, yeah. agree with that. Um, regardless of the size of of the FI or the size of the audience, it is not an insurmountable feat to have folks using these cards regularly to get greater value out of them than the big names. Um, it's just being mindful of the the things that you shared. So thank you yeah. very, very much, Doug. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Let's open it up for audience Q&A. Um, folks, if you have any questions or, or thoughts that you'd like to share, again, please use the Q&A box. I'll ask Brett to come back and see if we have any thus far. And if so, we can certainly talk through those. All right. One that we got just a few minutes ago are any FIs using Larky to drive card growth? How so? Um, I'll take that if it's okay, Doug. Card card growth through Larky. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talked about some of the examples. We talked about one example being the use of, of geolocation and targeting specific physical locations to then remind the cardholder of the value of using the debit card at that site. So the example I gave was using gas pumps and maybe there's a maybe there's a couple pennies off a gallon or 10% back on your purchase today by using your 123 credit union card or your community bank card here today it's really really powerful again remember using this channel of of mobile and the way that people resonate with that they they pay attention to it so as i pull up to the pump i'm checking my phone i'm actually pulling my phone out of the cup holder so while i'm pumping gas i can go through text messages and get caught up on email and so think about the power of being able to tap into that conversation at the right time in the right place it it, it works and so that is a really really strong way to do it um Think about also using it as at merchants that you're trying to promote in the community. Maybe there's a mom and pop chain of stores that you're trying to get. You're trying to have this um, symbiotic relationship where they're helping you, you're helping them, and then geofencing their locations and, and announcing to your account holders that there's a discount going on if you use your community FI debit card there. There are a ton of ways to do it. We have a lot of use cases and um, for anyone that is interested in talking more, I'd be happy to share kind of the real world actual application, what these notifications look like, the way that we strategize using location, the way that we strategize using broad-based messaging and also very granular targeted messaging. Th there's a lot you can do with it. Yeah, and, and those are, again, two ways in which you can differentiate over some of the larger fund institutions. The geofence aspect of that, that, that customization, that personalization, uh, and then the, uh, you know, in collaboration with local merchants, you know, playing that important part that fi community financial institutions play in the community by supporting local merchants and local small businesses and driving traffic to them. You know, it creates a symbiotic relationship, but also highlights the value that you are providing your customers and members and also highlighting the role that you play in the community. Yeah, absolutely. One, one other quick thing that popped in my brain based on one of Doug's takeaways that we just talked about. Think about um, the power of having your card at, as the default at, at Amazon, for example. And so Doug touched on this, but how do you accomplish that? So what if we were to pull a list of all accounts that had not seen an Amazon transaction and put them into a push notification campaign where we're talking about the value of adding them to the default Amazon 
card position. And as a result, we'll give the member account holder some sort of discount. So there are there are really calculated ways that we can help accomplish that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. We've got another one in here. We are really struggling with our card activations. What should we be doing to ensure our members are activating their debit cards? Well, I, I think we've done a lot of that, but that, that's a really yeah. good, good question. And it's a it's a it's a valid concern and it's all about being timely. Um, Doug, I'll let you respond if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, this is you know just to reinforce us, and it cannot be uh you know, it, it can't be overstated that the key thing with debit card activation is doing it right away. It is taking advantage of that very, very first interaction. Um, if a customer or member is in the branch, if you have instant issuous technology, you know, provide the card right then and activate the card right there and show whether it is via a, a tap to pay, whether it is uh, in taking the card and um, credentials into a mobile device, that is you know the the best opportunity for you to get that card activated and then on an ongoing basis when they leave the branch is when you use Larky to continue to shoot messages to remind people of all the benefits the safety the security the acceptance all those different things that um that you provide and that debit card provides to your new customer and member awesome thank you so we got another one in here. Doug, any insight into the adoption of faster payments, FedNow, RTP, from a community bank and credit union perspective, and how that can drive card volumes as use cases are developed? Uh, well, that's a you said it's a really interesting point. The uh, today we're just on the beginning of the evolution into real time payments and to fed now you know it's really just launching and you're starting to see the large uh, financial institutions smaller financial institutions processors uh, stepping up to enable that uh, i think it's a, less a question of how it's going to drive card volumes but more about how as an industry the payments um uh the payments industry needs to continue to innovate to stay ahead of that. Um, you know, there is the, it, your, t your products today, which work you know, flawlessly, which have the safety and security are going already accomplish everything that a, um, a real-time payment mechanism can accomplish. And I think it's important to continue to drive that active preference towards your, uh, towards your payment products as it relates to the competition that they're likely to see that your your customers and members are likely to see you know in the future when these new technologies start to really um take hold awesome thank you doug got another one in here any thoughts i think we might touch on this a little bit but any thoughts on using the debit card as a branding tool do you think that ship has sailed um I think it depends on how what we're talking about here. If it's if you're talking about co-branding, the traditional sort of thing where a debit card might be affiliated with a retailer or with some other merchant, that ship has sailed. Like there's just no, there's not enough revenue in those transactions to provide the rewards, which drives the interest because you're sharing rewards or you're, you're sharing uh, revenue with a uh, with the co-brand partner, kind of in exchange for their. Uh, in exchange for their access to their list and that sort of thing. Uh, but if you speak about it, just as it relates to branding itself, it's an important branding uh, exercise for the financial institution. Remember, this is the product that people are taking out of their physical wallet or they're, they're paying with their mobile device and your, your branding is displayed when you, um, when you pay with your mobile device. Um, you know, it is the way that you are most likely interacting with your customers and members every single day. Um, you know, certainly from a younger uh, member or customer standpoint, I mean, that's why they get a bank account today is because they need a debit card so they can pay for things. Um, and so that's an important aspect of your branding strategy, you know, not just the card art itself, but just the value that that, that payment product is providing to those uh, customers and members 
Um, there's also, you know, there continues to be rationale from the affinity standpoint. So if you are affiliated with a, like a university, as an example, to have, you know, card art and have products that showcase that affiliation, people don't generally spend more. This is, this is more true with credit than debit. With credit cards, you know, there used to be a generation ago, you could get thousands of credit cards that had that were affiliated with organizations and there were lots of those cards out in the marketplace but they didn't have high utilization uh, that's not necessarily true on the debit side uh, particularly when you look at the affiliation around like universities and other things where the, the, the affiliation doesn't necessarily drive the usage but it's an important element of the brand and your your uh, financial institutions connection to that organization uh, or to that university we think a lot about branding as as um, just getting your brand front and center in front of. I'm sorry, I heard an echo for a moment. If if anyone heard that, I apologize. Uh, but getting the branding front and center in the member, so you're you're planting these psychological seeds of your brand being visible by your audience, and so there is the indirect value of having your logo, your branding, whether it be on a card in a mobile wallet or via push notification out front and center. So when the member or customer does need a financial service, they're already thinking about you. So there's a lot of power to that. Um, I see one other question. I finally figured out how to open the Q&A thing. I see one other question. <laughs> I'll address that and then make sure we're out of here on time and I'll wrap us up. Um, the question is, does Larky use any other type of messaging other than push notifications? And I would just say that we are we are a complement to your existing communication strategy. So we are not there to displace what you're doing today, but really just give you a a better, more direct, more relevant way to communicate with your audience. So push notifications are the way that we do that. Um, we have integration with the most of the leading digital banking providers today. So to, again, use that mobile banking channel as the conduit between all the wonderful messaging and the objectives that you're trying to drive, and then the account holder's mobile device where we pay attention and we resonate with those messages. So um, please reach out. Love to talk to you more about it. Doug, thank you so, so much for sharing your insights and wisdom with the audience. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Today. It's been really great. Um, we will have this recording sent out to everyone. So please share with your teams. I can be reached at scott at larky.com and I'd love to continue the conversation. But thank you so much for your time today and, and we appreciate it. And we'll look forward to talking to you again soon.